Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We have Vinay Prabhu, Chief Scientist from Unify ID, and he is ready to share all this amazing information. Go ahead, Vinay. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here. Uh, this is my second MLConf. I enjoyed the previous edition as well. Uh, uh, kudos for the organizers for pulling this uh, in these tough times. Uh, let's uh, basically get down straight to it. So the talk is about uh, uh, basically it's it's an iconoclastic take on uh, trying to kind of uh, you know go to the community uh, towards considering options beyond one hot encoding. And the talk's title is "Help uh, Harnessing Equiangular Line Packings for Classification Problems as an Encoding Option Beyond One Hot Encoding That Is uh, Used in a Default Way." Uh, let me begin with uh, this cute visualization of caracal ears. Uh, should you not be able to take out uh, anything useful or important from my talk, you'll have this factoid with you that caracals do have autonomous muscles in their ears. So let's get down to the talk organization. The talk is split into five sections. I'll introduce the problem and I'll provide for the motivation as to what inspired this work. And then uh, we'll basically kind of do a, a quick survey of what people, uh, what the community has done uh, to kind of uh, demonstrate the ills and shortcomings of one-hot encoding that most of you would have used in your classification uh, pipelines. And then we'll kind of uh, visit this mystical realm of Grassmanian packing and optimal space packing to try and understand um, uh, what ideas we can import from this uh, rather mature uh, and interesting mathematical field and how we can also try and contribute back to this field. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about how to perform inference if you're training with these non one hot encoded vectors. Uh, and then I'll kind of give a brief tour of the uh, tools that we have curated for you to use and how uh, you can kind of uh, you know, contribute back to this community. Uh, so let's begin with uh, kind of taking a, a kind of a 10,000 feet viewpoint of uh, the marketplace of ideas and trying to understand why is it that suboptimal techniques and bad ideas uh, have kind of survived the test of time. And uh, you will find this kind of uh, cliched thing about, uh, you know, practitioners in any field uh, preferring the certainty of misery to the misery of uncertainty. There are different flavors of this, uh, like uh, perfection is the enemy of something that works, or a known angel is better than an unknown devil, which is why, you know, ideas like flat earth theory have still not died their natural death. And one such idea that I'd like to motivate within a supervised classification is using one hot encoding uh, for classification problems. Uh, so what does it uh, entail? It basically, so you have three flavors of encoding categorical data, right? So you have the nominal option. So you have three categories, a turtle, snail, and a butterfly. Um, and then you have the ordinal world where there is ordinality between the categories. So uh, example would be, I'm unhappy, I'm okay, I'm awesome. So these are three gradations of the level of happiness that can be encoded as 0, 0.5, and 1. And then you have the world of like binary codes, uh, whether you're present or absent and so on and so forth. So uh, one-hot encoding uh, basically means that if, you if I have three categories like turtle, uh, snail, and a butterfly, I'll re represent these categories uh, you, by using codes uh, in, into the numerical realm. So turtle would be represented by the code 100, snail would be represented by the code 010, and then butterfly would be 001. So you end up with a identity matrix as the encoding matrix. It is available by default in all platforms. Here you see visualization of me using it by using uh, the uh, scikit-learn pre-processing module that has one hot encoder, uh, you know, pre-implemented. You have uh, similar implementations in TensorFlow, Keras, in all different deep learning frameworks. So at the input, uh, you can. Uh, I think many of you would have worked with tabular data or textual data you would have seen uh, kind of the community weaning away from one hard encoding. And uh, that clearly it's a challenge that you have to grapple with when the vocabulary size and the cardinality of the categorical set kind of uh, you know goes uh, to pretty large numbers. So in one of WeWork's papers, they claim that for every uh, lead, they have 300,000 categorical, uh, uh, like that is the number of the cardinality of the set of categories. Uh, so they have figured this out. The NLP folks have, uh, you know, basically kind of made this uh, transition from the world of one-hot encoded uh, option to the world of, uh, you know, smooth, uh, dense vector representations. Here is a kind of a visualization of a timeline. Uh, so two thir 2013, we were using word to vec and the static options like word to vec and love, and we have kind of seen this paradigm shift towards attention-based, uh, you know, uh, contextual representations of. Uh, words or sentences, 
So you have word to work and uh, sentence to work flavors. And if you are interested more in this, uh, like understanding the lay of the land, what NLP people have done, there's a beautiful survey paper out recently by uh, DeepMind folks. Uh, please do take a, a look at that. So the, the point that I'm trying to convey with this obligatory Drake meme is that the NLP folks who have to grapple with uh, very large uh, cardinalities have kind of moved away from the world of one or encoded options to basically going into dense, uh, lower dimensional embeddings. Uh, so what about the output side of things? Uh, when, what happens when the uh, the number of output classes kind of explodes on the prediction side? So currently what we are doing uh, by default that's taught in all of the machine learning tutorials on Coursera or elsewhere is that you have three output nodes. If you, are, if you have three categories, uh, each of them represented by these 100 encoded vectors, and then you kind of throw in the cross entropy categorical loss and then you train your neural network. So what's wrong with this approach? Uh, it seems like reasonably straightforward. So you have one output node for each class. Isn't this reasonable enough? Well, uh, let's see what happens when we kind of progressively introduce new classes, right? So you have five classes. Okay, this is how the neural network looks like. It's a two-layered uh, uh, neural network and uh, you uh, introduce a new class. So you have to basically introduce, uh, you know, additional edges in the last, uh, you know, the pre-soft max layer. And then with seven, uh, 10 classes, again, like you'll get to see this kind of linear increase in the output parameters uh, every time you kind of introduce a new um, uh, class. Uh, but then this is not how human learning unravels, right? Every time you learn a new class or a new uh, category, you don't grow an output neuron in your brain. Uh, so besides this frivolousness, uh, you will kind of uh, see this, that you will end up with a situation where uh, if you have a very large number of classes, uh, the first few layers, which is actually kind of doing all of the heavy lifting, um, they're kind of doing this interesting kind of uh, twisting and turning of the uh, representation space, uh, you know, kind of uh, spanning through different flavors of manifolds, if you will. Um, you will see that uh, when you are looking into the neural real estate picture, most of the uh, weights will be kind of residing in the last layer, where it's just kind of throwing hyperplanes and boundaries between the uh, deep representations that are made available in the previous layer. So when you're training a neural network in this regime, uh, let us say you're training it on the GFT 300M dataset, which has like supp supposedly 18,000 different categories, you'll end up with uh, scenarios where most of your uh, uh, weights in the neural network are in fact in the last layer kind of doing the non-interesting or the dumb things uh, rather than uh, kind of doing, uh, for, I mean, and, and, and when you're looking at the training uh, as per, uh, going through epochs, you'll see that most of the times actually required in kind of fine tuning the last layer where the least interesting things are kind of happening. So this is this double neck, uh, sorry, so this bottleneck double whammy has been kind of uh, visited and revisited uh, uh, many times in literature. If you have uh, gone through the works of uh, Hoffer et al., where they basically said that. Uh, you know, they basically kind of saw through this problem and they said that, you know, probably we should not even be training the last layer, you know, just fix it by using Hadamard matrices and focus on training only the first few layers where the interesting things and the interesting nonlinear transformations happen. Uh, similarly, you have this paper by Sammy Benjio's group uh, titled All Layers Are, but the question this uh, dictated if uh, all layers are created equal. Uh, so this kind of frustration over this, uh, you know, this clump of large number of parameters residing in the most dumb part of the neural network, which is the pre-softmax uh, layer, has been kind of, uh, you know, attacked on several fronts. Uh, so when you're kind of doing a literature survey of what people have done uh, for options beyond one hot encoding, you'll find a lot of uh, very interesting works. Uh, if you recall the uh, 2015 paper that introduced the in inception architecture into the domain of computer vision actually had an entire section dedicated towards model regularization using uh, label smoothing, which is basically, again, it's a way of going away from, uh, you know, using these puritanical one hot encoded vectors and you're using smooth label vectors. Uh, that has benefits both in terms of uh, stabilized training uh, as well as kind of giving a, a better uh, accuracy. Um, and the 2015 paper on knowledge distillation kind of works on this a similar idea that there is this kind of deep hidden knowledge that is available in the soft max distributions of the uh, teacher model from which the students model train. And there, if you recall, the soft targets are not 100 encoded vectors, but they basically have like soft non-zero soft max values across uh, the you know the, the class space. So uh, similarly, uh, the 2016 paper by Francois Cholet uh, introduced information theoretical label embeddings beyond, uh, you know, one-hot encodings. Uh, recently, 
you know, you have this very nice paper uh, titled Angular Visual Hardness by the group from uh, Caltech and NVIDIA, where, again, uh, they're kind of motivating, uh, like, looking beyond using categorical cross-entropy as this go-to loss that one ought to use in a, a supervised classification framework. So what can we add to this body of literature? So we now kind of uh, motivate uh, using Grassmannian packings, and the motivation goes something like this. So our mandate is to get away from uh, these uh, n-dimensional sparse one coded vectors to go into lower dimensional space and using these dense uh, encodings. So the question is, who's going to give you the encodings in the first place? Uh, like NLP people had a huge treasure trove of textual data to work with, but if I basically give you a new classification problem, um, uh, basically trying to classify different kinds of nuts and bolts uh, on a production pipeline, if you will, then the question is, how do you come up with these uh, you know, dense embeddings without domain knowledge? So uh, let's say that you don't have any domain knowledge. Let's look at what your wish list kind of looks like. So you basically have no semantic assumptions about what the categories are and what the categories are and what they mean uh, and the semantics of the label space. You have to assume that given that you don't know anything about the uh, label vectors, the cool thing about one hot encoded vectors is that they're mutually orthogonal to each other. So similarly, you would want in this case uh, for the label vectors uh, to be pairwise equidistant between any two given classes. Uh, and given a specific embedding dimension, you want them to be as far apart as possible so that you can exploit the dimensionality real estate as efficiently as possible. Uh, and then, uh, it's, you know, the uh, the producing these 100 encoded ve vectors should not require a lot of training and using auto encoders and stuff like that. They should be off the shelf available. And lastly, they should come up, you should have like a bunch of uh, optimal guarantees that kind of gives you, uh, you know, some peace of mind that you don't have to spend any more time in basically finding better embeddings. Uh, so what we are trying to do, like I've seen this visualization, is you're basically trying to go from these six-dimensional 100-coded vectors into lower-dimensional space, let us say three dimensions, and we know for a fact that these, this is the optimal code book. So, so now we'll try and understand how it is that we can unearth all of these, uh, these magical code books that satisfy all of these constraints. So luckily, people have worked on this, and knowingly or unknowingly, this kind of falls into the larger gambit of problems called optimal space packing. Uh, the grocers uh, do this when they're kind of packing oranges. Um, you have like a plethora of papers that talk about like the available, the, the ubiquity of uh, hexagonal closed packing of spheres in the nature around us. Nature does optimal space packing really well. Bees do it. Uh, so in the, in the world of applied mathematics, uh, the brief tour entails the fact that, okay, you have the problem of the problem specification. Uh, that was done by Grassman, hence the name Grassmannian space packing. A spe specific case of that is Grassmannian line packing, where the, sp uh, the space that you're trying to embed in a larger mother space uh, is basically of dimension one. And then again, you have this dichotomy between uh, uh, you know, complex domain and the real domain. Complex domain is used heavily in wireless communications. Uh, so you have these treasure trove of optimal code books that you can shop for. Uh, whereas when it comes to equiangular line packings, there's still a lot of work to be done, and you have to kind of use these putatively optimal codebook construction techniques or have to kind of bank on the shoulders of giants who worked in the domain of algebraic graph theory. And using this inspiration, uh, you know, we have come up with this algorithm. Here is the picture of the algorithm. Uh, I don't have too much time to kind of go into the details of uh, how we kind of, uh, like the math behind it, uh, but it comes with optimal guarantees and... Uh, uh, you know, you can also kind of see that, uh, you know, it, it has this kind of knob, which is in the form of like, it's called the K factor or the angular factor. So if you want to keep these lines as far apart as possible, so depending on how demanding you are in terms of like the angle of separation, then you will have to kind of in, go into a higher dimensional space. So this is kind of seen in this plot where as you kind of try to increase the spacing between the lines, then you have to go into higher and higher dimensional spaces. And then if you say that, you know what, I want my angles to be orthogonal to each other, mutually orthogonal to each other, which is 90 degrees, then you'll end up with, uh, you know, the one out encoded space. Uh, so uh, given this, uh, we'll kind of try and see how to kind of apply this into real world uh, problems uh, in the forthcoming sites. So similarly, if you are uh, not, if you are willing to relax this demand a little bit and you say that, you know, you know what, the classes don't have to be exactly uh, equidistant from each other in the angular domain. I'm okay with nearly equiangular. Then you can kind of go into much lower domains, uh, sorry, lower dimensional spaces. And we have, uh, uh, you know, an optimal algorithm for that. You can just take these uh, 
you know, code books that we have pre-computed. You can just drag and drop it into your pipeline. And you will see that as you kind of go into lower and lower dimensional spaces. So for uh, if for this is for the image net 1000 classes. So if you want to go down to finite and 12 dimensions, then you will see this uh, interesting concentration that happens where all of the pairwise angles are almost orthogonal. They fall in the uh, sweet spot between 86.5 degrees to 90 degrees. Uh, which is the angle of separation between each other. And as you kind of make, uh, your, if you're more and more demanding in terms of wa wanting to go into lower and lower dimensional spaces, where you want to kind of compress your last layer, then you'll have to kind of, you'll see this kind of spread happening. And this beautiful phenomenon is actually uh, recently been studied by, uh, you know, Towering Minds and Applied Mathematics, such as Terence Tao. Uh, please do kind of sift through their work. It's a very interesting line of work that also begets contributions from uh, people who are well-versed with GPU programming. Um, and we'll kind of revisit how you can kind of, kind of go back and contribute to this domain of mathematics uh, towards the end of the talk. So what we're proposing is that the legacy entails using one-hot encoded schemes and basically training neural networks with categorical cross-entropy laws and using argmax for uh, inference. But now we are going to basically be using, instead of using one-hot encoded vectors, we're using dense vectors, and we are training in, in the uh, re uh, regression framework by using a cosine distance loss or similar loss like that. Now the question is, how do we do inference? Uh, so uh, you, what happens is that you basically have this code book that you have trained that resides on this hypersphere, and then you have an input that goes into a neural network. And this time, the neural network kind of spits out a dense embedding, which is not like, uh, you know, you cannot kind of have the softmax-like interpretations to these. Then what you do is you go back and you find who the uh, nearest neighbors are with regards to the code book in the Angular domain, and then the inference now becomes nearest neighbor search in the Angular domain. So to recap, we began with uh, the classical framework where we're using one-hot encoded vectors, and we were training that using categorical cross-entropy loss. Now we are kind of going away from that, and you are training all neural networks, even for classification problems, as regression problems, where your classes are basically these one-hot, these dense embeddings, and then for inference, you are basically doing argmen over the angular space. Now the question is, isn't this kind of an expensive thing that you have this extra gadgetry that's required for inference before you could just do argmax? Now you'll have to do argmen in the Angular domain. And thankfully, uh, this is where you have kind of meeting of two powerful ideas. So one was basically phase, which is like a, a, a fast uh, similarity search al uh, you know, algorithm that was uh, proposed by Facebook AI research. You have extremely uh, optimal implementations available. And when you, this meets with the computational muzzle power of the state-of-the-art GPUs, uh, that is actually pre-implemented in the QML library uh, within the Rapids AI framework, uh, you have magic that happens. So for example, you can kind of, if you have pre-estimated uh, dense embeddings for all of the image net, the 50,000 classes, you can do the inference on like a very uh, widely available commercial GPU like IU Titan RDX uh, that's pretty much sitting right there. Uh, so I was able to kind of do inference on the entirety of the image net uh, uh, data set in 0.6 seconds. Uh, so if you were to use uh, you know something like an off-the-shelf implementation that is the KD tree on scikit-learn, um, I'm using 501 dimensional embeddings. It takes uh, typically about uh, you know 25 minutes uh, for the entire inference to happen. Whereas with QML, you get 103 times speed up. So this is kind of rather spectacular uh, again. So the whole boogeyman of like uh, basically having to do this cumbersome uh, you know nearest neighbor search kind of goes away because you have the meeting of uh, a fast similarity search that's now implemented in an optimal way on GPUs. So if you basically have a pre-trained neural network that's already been trained on one-hot encoded vectors, and if you want to compress it by maintaining similar levels of accuracy, absolutely no worries. Uh, you can just focus on the last uh, you know, layer. You, you basically throw away the one-hot encoded vectors. You have these new um, uh, you know, uh, dense embeddings uh, that are your targets. You just solve it as a regression problem and you'll be able to use, and then you kind of use this fast nearest neighbor search and you'll be able to kind of deploy it by making like uh, you know profound gains in terms of like the compression that you enjoyed without make, making even a little bit of surgery in terms of having to retrain the neural network or having to do any sort of uh, you know uh, lottery ticket search. So the question is, okay, uh, I've kind of proposed this fancy thing. Does it even work? So we kind of have done uh, initial studies in the domain of computer vision, the standard CIFARs and the MNIST. Yes, it works off the shelf. Uh, we tried it within the domain of NLP with the Stanford Sentiment 
uh, tree bank, yes, it works. Uh, time series classification on the IDNet data set, yes. Uh, same is true uh, by just using off-the-shelf architectures and just retraining the last layer. We also got like slight improvements in speech classification. So as you can see, the proof is in the pudding. Yes, we agree. And we have demonstrated uh, through rigorous empirical uh, examples across multiple domains that yes, it works uh, seamlessly well. And uh, if you're now interested in trying to understand as to, uh, okay, you have seemingly have this new a uh, way of uh, basically using uh, dense embeddings that are available off the shelf, and you have these pre-computed code books. How do I use this? And uh, you know, how do I kind of build an intuition about this domain? And how do I contribute back? So this section kind of deals with that. So uh, let's kind of do a very quick recap as to what we proposed. So what we said was, look, there is this off the shelf, uh, like there is this default uh, habit within uh, supervised learning to use one hot encoded labels uh, for your uh, classes. And uh, there are there's a kind of growing sense of resentment towards this practice. And you have these bunch of options uh, where there is motivation towards uh, goading the community to go towards Angular domain, where you can also, instead of using the softmax values, which are not really probability values, and it's very hard to interpret them. Now you have like these angles, and even your uh, when you kind of introduce an out-of-domain uh, input, then the interpretations can be now had in terms of like the angle of separation between the prototypes of the classes being modeled. So we basically proposed a solution by looking into uh, the uh, huge amount of work available within optimal space packing, because this is literally a space packing problem where you're going into a lower dimensional space. You want to keep the class prototypes as far apart as possible, and you want to be doing this off the shelf. And people have done this, and we are kind of standing on the shoulders of giants by looking into uh, you know things like uh, pre-computed code books. And then uh, we basically saw how to use them across different domains. And uh, should you be interested in trying to uh, kind of uh, understand the lay of lands as a uh, lay of the land as to how to kind of uh, import these code books from these treasure troves that are already available uh, that have been pre-computed by uh, applied mathematicians, we have created a set of tutorials. Uh, here is a GitHub link uh, where we kind of uh, give you demonstrations as to how to go through these uh, pre-available code books and how to download them and use them in your pipelines. Uh, and uh, here is a, a very quick demonstration. So all that you need to do is basically type in the number of classes, and then you just call one function, which is ELP underscore gen, and then you pass this number of classes. Uh, and then you can also give this separation uh, constraint that's not required, and you outcomes. And as you can see, uh, it's a super fast uh, algorithm. Uh, instantaneously, you will get these code books. You literally have to spend two lines in Python, just declare the number of classes, pass it into this function, and out comes the code book that you can now use instead of one hot encoded labels in your uh, pipeline. Just replace your uh, one, I mean, categorical cross entropy loss with an angular loss, and you train your neural network. If you have already pre trained your neural network, don't have to retrain from scratch. Just you know, basically solve the regression problem for the last layer. That can be done efficiently using NVIDIA Rapids as well. And if you are interested in basically kind of uh, looking at more semantic options, uh, we have also uh, kind of curated this data set of club embeddings for ImageNet 1K class. So, you know, uh, this is uh, if, when you have like the semantics available within the label space, you can use pre trained uh, embeddings from NLP, uh, either in the form of club embeddings, or uh, you can use BERT if you have more contextual knowledge about your label space. So, you can now kind of retrain your uh, ImageNet uh, models. Uh, now with not one hot encoded labels, but glove embeddings, uh, so that you can kind of get more, uh, you can get inferences in the Angular domain. Uh, similarly, like I said, if you're proposing a new architecture, if you're working on a new architecture, um, you basically have cre created a, a set of resources where you can kind of, uh, you know, use our uh, pre-trained embeddings and pre-trained codes, and you can retain only the last layer of your neural network to basically get a more compressed version. Uh, so here you can see that uh, you know you had like 2048 dimensional uh, pre-softmax vectors, and then this would have been 1000 dimensional output layer, and you're going to, you're kind of shrinking it down to 501. Now the question is, how low of a dimension can I go? That has to be empirically kind of validated. And if we have time, I can kind of go through some uh, empirical work that's been done that basically say that, uh, as you kind of go into lower dimensional space, 
uh, it's not a very monotonic fall in accuracy. You kind of have these ups and downs, and that's very interesting in itself. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done in here. So uh, this is a call for contributions to the community that's attending this talk, that we want to build a bridge between both worlds, and this is a bidirectional bridge. So you have the world of Grassmanian packings and these optimal packings that can now use uh, GPUs to kind of hunt for better code books in these putatively optimal regimes where there are no optimal code books available and the hunt is still going on. And within the domain of compu computer vision or generally uh, you know, supervised classification where you are trying to train neural networks with, uh, especially with large number of classes, you are looking for uh, you know, uh, non one hot coded options. You want to kind of compress your last layer where most of the weight might reside. So this is kind of, uh, you know, any, uh, gains here can be uh, kind of fed into your neural network uh, output layer and vice versa where we can use these uh, neural network kind of based designs or even hunting algorithms to kind of come up with these GPU aided, um, uh, you know, uh, co codes uh, that can basically kind of generate more uh, putatively optimal codes, especially in uh, uh, regimes where there are absolutely no optimal code books available. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to need to interrupt you. It's all great. Indeed. Okay, yeah. you can wrap up. Please wrap up. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that was it. So thank you so much for your time. And this is basically the snapshot of uh, the uh, resources that we have curated. If you have any further questions, uh, feel free to DM me uh, at this my Twitter handle. Uh, and uh, this is, like I said, it's a call uh, that can kind of, uh, that is targeting both communities, the applied mathematicians, as well as, the machine learning uh, practitioners. If you are basically using a one hot encoded vectors, especially in the large label space regime, uh, this is uh, an excellent uh, technique that you can use off the shelf. You don't have to kind of train anything from scratch. Uh, these are pre-available code books that you can download from our repository. If you are interested in basically contributing to the domain of uh, ma this applied mathematics where you want to hunt for better code books, uh, no one's actually kind of used GPUs to uh, kind of better this hunt. Uh, we've done some initial work. We have the PyTorch code available for you to use. Uh, please do uh, kind of go through these repositories. If you have any questions, just uh, send a message. And thank you so very much for your time and patience. If you have any questions, I'm all ears. You're fantastic, Vinay. At this point, we have Galena standing yeah. by. So anyone with questions, please enter them in your stage chat. And Vinay will be monitoring that chat feature. And you'll be answering your questions live on that chat feature. So we thank you. It was fantastic, Vinay.